work-life balance. It's at the top of everybody's list of desirable career benefits. Now, the Naveen Jindal School of Management offers students help on how to plan for this in their own lives, a podcast formerly called the Yet Another MBA GOAT podcast, greatest of all time, naturally, has been rebranded as Between Business and Life. An MBA student today, a balanced professional tomorrow. It's another way that the Jindal School seeks to prepare students to become effective leaders in their future roles. The podcast offers new episodes monthly featuring thought leaders who have achieved success in their careers as well as an excellent work-life balance. Each episode is designed to equip students with the knowledge of business trends while inspiring them to manage both business and life. Now here's Lisa Schatz, Assistant Dean for the MBA programs at the Jindal School. Take it away, Lisa. you guys. Welcome back here again for another episode of Between Business and Life. And today we have a really fascinating topic of sustainability. And we're talking to Thea Junt, who is the environmental sustainability consultant at Southwest Airlines. Hi, thanks, Lisa. So good to see you again. You too. Been missing this place. (laughs) So um, Thea, as you can tell, was uh, one of our MBA students. And at the time she was an MBA student, she was also heading up our sustainability efforts here at uh, UT Dallas. But really, uh, most of uh, your career was sustainability at places like UT Southwestern and Children's, like I said, here, and then also on the government side with Texas Commission of Environmental Quality and NOAA Fisheries. Right. Yes. It's so, been a, an adventurous career. Yeah. And, and a career a lot of people seek to uh, to kind of follow. So we'll, we'll get in, into that in a little bit. But I think the timing of this episode is so good because I was just doing my research and reading that your new uh, strategy has just come out for Southwest Airlines, and it's called Nonstop to Net Zero. Do you want to give a little bit of a highlight of your new strategy and how it differs maybe from your former strategy? Yeah, I think it's very interesting. Southwest Airlines has always been slow and steady um, to make changes. During COVID, one of our corporate strategy projects was to figure out where our gap was in sustainability programming. The outcome of that were sustainability goals that was uh, nonstop by 2050 to align with all the other airlines and and really make an impact. Um, There were goals around sustainable aviation fuel. And and these goals are very big. They're very lofty. They are hard to touch and hard to grasp. It is very difficult to think, oh, what are my carbon emissions? What are they going to be in 2050? And how can I touch that? How can I have an impact on that? There's, You'll see where it's this many cars off the road or this many trees planted. Those, those really aren't tactile things that people can understand and touch. It is, it is a tough world. We had four pillars to replace uh, jet fuel with sustainable aviation fuel to um, bring down emissions to reduce our consumption of that jet fuel through fuel savings initiatives, offset some of those remaining um, programs through qualifying offsets or good quality offsets, and then uh, to partner with organizations that help meet our goals and uh, really help round out that sustainability structure. Every year we go through and do a plan refresh and say, what do we need to do now? What is next? And this past year we said, we need some tangible goals. We need things we can touch that our employees can do and our customers can see. And so we wound up saying, how does this fit into this new structure? So we've got a big focus on carbon reduction. That's the first C in our, our new pillars. Um, and that is where we'll have our jet fuel reduction, our, our sustainable aviation fuel impact. We, we qualified the second um, pillar under circularity, where we can plan through our supply chain. What are we purchasing? Where did it come from? Where is it going to go when we're done? Those are big questions that we need to ask and work on. They have a huge impact on sustainability. And our third one is collaboration. So all of our still partner organizations and programs are are still part of that strategy. But we came up with the nonstop to net zero. It is just making our strategy bigger. And we have just announced five operational sustainability goals, things that we can see and touch. That is a fuel savings initiative and 
quantifying that. It is a recycling goal. It is single-use plastics reduction on board. When we ask customers what's important about sustainability, they say recycling and single-use plastics. Yep. Jet, jet fuel's not in the top five. And talk about something you can see, because every time on a, I'm on an airline and I'm watching them just hand out those drinks and mm-hmm. all the plastic and all the cans, yeah, um, I can't help but think, you know, and I think some of the airlines aren't even recycling those. Recycling is really tough in an airline. And the other two goals I want to point out are electrification of our ground service equipment. So we burn fuel in in airplane. We also burn fuel in all the vehicles that support those airplanes. And the fifth goal is about energy savings uh, in our buildings specifically. So just like UT Dallas has a huge building footprint, so does Southwest Airlines. And that is something that any organization can really look at. Saving energy does reduce your environmental impact. So so let's talk about the... um fuel itself. So you said reduction of fuel and then use of SAF, which is sustainable aviation fuel. How do you reduce fuel? Because they're airplanes, they need to run. And what is SAF exactly? Ooh, saving fuel. That is a super exciting thing to me, nerding out a little bit. (laughs) We can save fuel by turning off the engines when we're sitting at the gate. That Mm -hmm. seems simple. Um, But we have two engines. We have to turn them off for safety. There's a third engine in the back, that auxiliary power unit, that we can turn off if we plug that airplane into ground power and use the preconditioned air that's underneath, hanging underneath the jet bridge. That provides air conditioning or heating to the airplane while that auxiliary power unit's off. Doesn't seem like a lot. That adds up to millions of gallons of jet fuel. There's another fuel savings opportunity. It's pretty standard. When we are taxiing out and we have a long taxi out because we're in a big airport or it's kind of congested, only run one engine. It's called single engine taxi. It's pretty common in airlines. It saves a lot of fuel. When we are flying, we can use weather data to make sure we are in the optimum altitude to take advantage of winds. That tailwind really helps us fly a little faster, a little more fuel efficient. So we call that real-time wind data, um, and that does produce fuel savings. Back in the 90s and in early 2000s, all the plane got the little winglets. Huge fuel savings initiative. Hmm. So there are things we can do to the airplane. There are ways we can operate it that all save fuel. And we got good programs to quantify that and um, calculate that to contribute to fuel savings goals. And and sounds like little things, but I read that it, this year even before some of the initiatives that you're doing, um, Southwest saved 33 million gallons yes. of fuel. So it yeah. really does add up. It does add up. And it's all the airlines are doing this. It is smart business to save fuel. Yeah. Um, so the sustainable aviation fuel it is how can we make fuel that didn't come from fossil fuels? It is a huge industry that is popping up. We want to buy sustainable aviation fuel. We want to fly with it. We have to encourage development of that industry. So there there are lots of players in that space. It is very interesting and very innovative. We can't wait to to get more. Right now, Southwest Airlines is uplifting SAF to Oakland. Um, so we have a partner that manufactures it, deliver it to Oakland, and that's where it comes into our, our fuel system. So this kind of leads to another question that I had, which is, how do the oil and gas companies play into sustainability? Because in the old days, I remember them being the bad guys. And now it seems like a lot of the initiatives that are coming around regarding energy are actually being done by the ExxonMobil's and the BPs and and the bigger companies. And are they the ones who will be providing the uh, SAF? So I'm not qualified to speak on (laughs) ExxonMobil's, Chevron's, Philip 66 of the bunch. But they are all participants in developing these technologies. Refining processes for oil and gas are very similar processes to refining products into SAF. They've got that expertise and that knowledge. Um, I was on a call yesterday with ExxonMobil. It was on advanced plastics recycling. So I think there's a lot of innovation at those companies. They've got a lot of resources and a lot of big thinkers. They're also really big partners of ours. We buy a lot of jet fuel. Um, so we have good relationships, and we we do support them developing more SAF infrastructure. So we hear a lot about sustainability, and we know that it's good for Southwest and other companies because of the PR side and the social responsibility, and it's what you should do. 
is it good for business? If if those things those things in themselves are good for business, but if it weren't for that side of it, is sustainability good business? Yes, yes, it is. Um, Herb, our founder, and um, he said, if you take care of your employees, your employees will take care of your customers, and your customers are going to take care of that stock price. It is it is good business to take care of our employees. We have to be good community partners. Um, part of that is sustainability. Part of that is the environmental side. Are we reducing pollution where we can? Are we mitigating emissions from our ground service vehicles at different airports? That is how we are contributing to an environmental impact um, at a local level. Socially, we do a really great job giving back to our communities. Our employees are amazing. We have huge volunteer programs and enable that our employees to participate in that. Southwest has a great program called Tickets for Time, and that is where our employees volunteer at nonprofits. For every 40 hours that we volunteer, that organization can get airline tickets. Um, So our employees are volunteering in their communities, giving back locally, and then Southwest also matches that with uh, airline tickets. I think it's good for business. I think it's good for our customers. I think it's really good for our employees. So so basically, Southwest is double giving. They're giving of their employees time and then they're giving tickets on yes. top of that. So yeah. um, so there's no reason for a company not to take advantage of that. Right. And the PR that we build up is internal. It feels so good to do those things. It makes us want to do more and more. And our company and our company culture rewards that. It's a pretty neat place to be. That's great. That's why... All of our students talk about going to Southwest. <laughs> it's pretty freaking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so since you're talking about kind of a little bit more f- fun mm-hmm. uh, kind of things that Southwest does, I'm going to ask you about Turnip Green. <laughs> oh, yes, please do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So our Repurpose with Purpose program um, is run by a, a senior program manager out of Nashville. She is amazing. Her name's Anna Schwager. Um, I have gotten to work with her now for, I met her early on in my career at Southwest about two years ago, and I've gotten to work closely with her since then. Turnip Green Creative Reuse is a nonprofit in Nashville, and they work with the local community, to take back products, or I found all these crayons when I cleaned out my mom's house, whatever it might be. They will take it and they will allow others to come in and and use those products, borrow them, buy them, whatever it might be, support local artists with supplies, and then those artists can sell those materials. Southwest donates seat covers. So you'll see our blue seat covers and sometimes the really old ones, the blue and tan seat covers, and we donate those to Turnip Green. Turnip Green gives those to local artists and those artists turn them into magical pieces they can sell. So you can buy them on the Turnip Green uh, website. I like to scan through and and see what they're coming up with. It is amazing. I think we're up to 12 or 13 different partners in our Repurpose with Purpose program. They are so meaningful. So meaningful to their communities and to the people they serve. It is it's pretty it's magical it feels so good to be part of that from the seat covers that come off um you know we that's a, a program we do a seat overhaul every three or four years all the seats come off a plane they go get touched up re- refurbished um, and before i'm sure they went to the landfill um yeah we've had this program since 2014 mm-hmm. but um yes that was who knew what to do with them right and so now when the seat covers come off, we are able to re- repurpose the cushions and the actual leather. And and so that has a huge sustainability program or impact. Mm-hmm. We have this waste. How can it not be a waste? And how can we put it to good use? And Southwest said, how can we put it to a good use, but also have a benefit to a community? It It's one of another one of those programs that just fills you up inside. It's so amazing. Yeah, I'm surprised. When I when I learned about it, I thought, why doesn't every town have this? Because, you know, I think about, you know, when we redo a room in our house and we're pulling out old mirrors and, mm-hmm. you know, doors and stuff like that, that, all stuff that people could cut up and use. Um, if anybody is interested in hearing more about it, there's a great YouTube video out there. Just look at Turnip Green and Southwest. Yeah. Um, and it's it was really interesting to see some of the artists making clothing and, you know, 
all, all kinds of stuff with the leather. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm sure it gets expensive buying all those products. It does. Um, it's a really good quality product, um, but it really creates an opportunity for artists to connect and and sell their wares. You know, there's another um, program in Costa Rica. I keep trying to get an invite to that one. Um, <laughs> but they, Southwest donated um, grant money, leather making tools, and the leather created a workshop to teach women how to use these materials. And they are able to go on and create businesses to support um, the hospitality industry the Costa Rica local shops in the airports by supplying this leather that they made into magical items. Um, it, it's been pretty, it's been very well received. It's an amazing program. But again, this is that community investment. Um, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, fantastic. And and so common sense, right? It doesn't seem like, a, an, it's like, why didn't we think of that before, right? Right. Um, Right now, we send 100% of our recovered um, leather goes to partners. We, we don't have a waste from that um, process. This episode is brought to you by the UT Dallas MBA programs, top ranked nationally and in Texas. The UT Dallas MBA combines a robust core with 13 concentrations. You have an option to add a second master's degree. Your choices for that include five STEM designated programs. The MBA program has full-time, part-time, online, and other formats. They give you flexibility to fit your MBA education into your busy schedule. The skills and training you will receive are exactly what top employers are looking for. For more information, visit us online at mba.utdallas.edu. Well, it sounds like so far, um, Southwest has really been a leader in the sustainability world. As I was reading in What's Next kind of looking forward, there were a lot of words I didn't know, a lot of concepts that I think you probably know more about. But from a perspective of looking forward at the trends that are coming, the technologies that are coming for sustainability, um, I was reading about things like Cirrus Clouds, Sust- Sustainability Flight Demonstrator, X66. Don't know what any of those are. Um, Cirrus Clouds. Let's, <laughs> let's do that one first. Um, those are just a type of clouds. But there there is concern that aviation-induced cirrus clouds, contrails, persistent contrails, have a global warming effect that could be net warming for some contrails, net cooling for other contrails. Part of that is we we don't have good science for what that means. What is the global impact or the warming impact compared to CO2 emissions that have been really well studied? Um, can we put a number on that contrail, on that aviation-induced cirrus cloud. Um, So we're still working on all the science. We've got some pretty good partnerships um, and projects going on. The airline industry in particular, there's a big task force. Um, Europe, America, FAA, NASA, all the airlines, so many thought leaders um, in the industry are working to figure out what our contrail impact is. Um, So when a plane is flying, if it's flying through an area with a lot of humidity, the exhaust, that very hot exhaust from the plane, might have a soot impact where water vapor can coalesce on that soot, forming ice particles, cloud particles, and they just get bigger and bigger. So when you see the the contrails following a cloud, and they dissipate quickly. Yes, those were contrails, but they dissipated. They're not going to have a long-lasting impact. Some days in some areas, every cloud, every airplane will leave a contrail and then they just last and they spread out. And by the end of the day, you just have a little light cover um, across the zone, across your whole area. I've seen it in Phoenix. I've seen it, you know, it's just interesting. That is aviation induced cirrus cloud, a cloud that would not have been there were it not for the right weather and all the airplanes. So quantifying that. Is that a warming contrail, a warming cloud? It's it's like a blanket at night. The heat can't escape. Is it a cooling contrail? It is it reflecting sunlight during the day that that's actually cooling, you know, shading the ground under it. We're still doing the science on that to figure it out. 
but then taking the next step. Okay, how could we predict where that contrail was going to form? How can we avoid it? How long did that contrail last? Um, and can we make maneuvers to make it last less, um, to make it not be as impactful? Unless it's a good Im- impact. And, but is it good? If it's cooling, if it's cooling Phoenix, if the people of Phoenix would say, pretty, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> so we're still, we're in the learning phases. Um, we've got some experiments going on. It's it's really super interesting. Um, and we are part of the conversation. It's neat. I don't like to tout other airlines, but there is a really good video by Google and American Airlines um, that is really informative and, and pretty, it's just a great indicator and education piece on um the airline induced con- or air- airplane induced contracts. It, uh, that is interesting. Slide. Oh, sustainable flight demonstrator mm-hmm. and, um, and X66. X66. The plane you bought in 1960 is not going to be the plane you should buy in 2060. And both of those are projects to figure out what that plane should be. It is super interesting for the manufacturers, the engine manufacturers. Airbus and Boeing to see what does the next plane look like? How do we make it more fuel efficient? How do we make it more e- effective, more comfortable for passengers? Um, there's a lot of great projects going on under those um, headlines um, to see what that plane will look like. So I have a question about that. There is a, as little as I know on the topic, there is one thing that I know, and it's that when non-airline sustainability, just general when you read about sustainability, There is one way that they feel like they can get um, pollution out of the air, and it's with airplanes where they're basically, I don't know, they have filters or something they're flying around. And the way the reason that that does not work is because they're making more pollution than saving by sending the, the planes out. But these planes are already in the air. Right. Is there anything um, when you look at these future planes, do you think they will have something on it that's cleaning the air as they go? I have no idea, but it is so exciting to think about. I've seen some direct air capture tests with trains. Like one of the cars on the train is a direct air capture. And as it it's going along, it is capturing air, filtering it, and it is trying to collect pollution so it doesn't go out. It'll be really interesting to see what comes of all of this. It's it's gonna be very innovative and very exciting space. That would be exciting to think. I'm taking a flight, and it's actually helping the environment. Right. Every time I buy a ticket, I'm doing a little bit to help clean the air. Yeah. That would be that would be new. Our audience is generally MBA students and Hello, perspective MBA <laughs> students and prospective MBA <laughs> students. Happy to have you here today. Um, I hear all the time students saying, you know, I'm I'm getting my MBA because I want to work in sustainability, um, and I always tell them, go out and look, mm-hmm. look at a role for, say, like a financial analyst and see how many come up and then look for a sustainability manager and see how many come up. There's not a lot of sustainability jobs out there. What should I tell my students? That you can make any job more sustainable. So if you are the financial analyst whiz kid of your company, you can make that company more sustainable. Where are your investments? Are you investing in ESG? Where's the recycling at your facility? Can you, you can make change in any role that leads to a more sustainable work and and job and company. I do not have a degree in sustainability. I have a master's in supply chain and an MBA with a focus on energy. It's pretty exciting. I'm very (laughs) proud of that, by the way. Um, But my undergrad's biochemistry. That's science, but it's not sustainability. I think a lot of people should get a degree in what you like what interests you, take the sustainability class if that interests you, but then look and see how you can have an impact in your finance classes. If you're doing the healthcare project um, or you'd like the healthcare concentration, how can you make healthcare more sustainable? I will tell you there's a lot of opportunities there, Um, whether it's in waste or whether it's in energy, um, fuels. There's so many opportunities, but take what you're good at, take what you like, and make it more sustainable. I did it. I'm like, I I worked for NOAA Fisheries. I did environmental health and safety. And I had an employee come up and say, yeah, I can compost at home. Why can't I compost at work? Great. I think we can. Let's ask. What are they going to do? Say no? So we asked, and we got a program, and then we composted at work. And they said, yeah, I've got this chemical, and, and legally I can throw it down the drain, but I know what it's doing to fish, and I don't feel comfortable putting it down the drain. 
all right, let's see, how can we treat that water? How can we keep that out of our waterways? That is making work more sustainable. Right. I had a mechanic and he's like, yeah, I'm going to replace these pumps. And and I'm going to, this was my favorite project up in, in Seattle. He said, I'm, I'm going to replace these pumps and, and the new ones are more efficient. And I heard we can get an incentive from our utility company for more and more efficient pumps. I said, okay, well, let's let's try it. Let's see what happens. And so throughout that whole project, we coordinated with utility. They came in, did all their P's and Q's and engineering analysis on it. We, they wound up giving us a hundred thousand dollar utility bill credit because we made a more efficient project. And that was our mechanic. So just really enabling people who want to do the right thing, leveraging that, we made that project, that facility much more sustainable. That's great. So it's a great story. You can do it in your job. Yeah. Sometimes it's just, it's like the, uh, the case of giving the seats to the uh, turnip green. Sometimes it's just thinking about stuff we're not programmed to think about. Right. All right. Well, so the podcast is between business and life. And so we talked about the business part. Let's talk about life. We, we try to bring in guests that manage to have a successful career and at the same time, a well-rounded life. And that's something that we all struggle with. But young people really make a very high priority. Tell us a little bit about the things you do outside of work. Well, I am a gardener. I do plant for the butterflies and the bees. If you look at my Instagram, I don't recommend it, by the way. But they're, it's heavy on the caterpillars. Okay, I think they're cute. <laughs> I think they're cute. Find stuff that interests you. My husband and I play golf. We play tennis. We started pickleball, but man, that's dangerous on the knees. I got to tell you. <laughs> but um, find things that you like that are fulfilling. My my caterpillar addiction. I plant for the the specific species of butterfly to to lay their eggs on. Their host plants. That's what the caterpillars develop on. I have nieces and nephews who also plant the host plants, and we send pictures back and forth. Thea, look, I found some eggs. Thea, look, I've got caterpillars. Which instar is this? So kind of gotten to take some of that sustainability home. And actually, it probably grew at home and and transpired and and transferred to work. But I I have a great life. I love it. Lots of family and now lots of travel. Um, There's some big perks to working for an airline. (laughs) Um, It's pretty great life. I'm very satisfied. I finally found a job that is fulfilling. I, I say I, I went through two jobs that were good, not fulfilling, wasn't satisfied working there. I still did a good job, but I definitely kept my eyes open for what was next. I like a fulfilling job. I found one. That's awesome. Where was your favorite trip? Oh, my gosh. So haven't even done anything wild and crazy yet like Fiji, but um, I got to go to England and Ireland. It was pretty awesome. And it was in February, and it wasn't even that awful weather-wise. But got to go see um, some pretty amazing things. Went with my friend Anna Schwager from the Repurpose with Purpose program. Ireland was beautiful. Beautiful. We, we actually took the MBA students there last year. I heard. I'm like, <laughs> don't you need chaperones? <laughs> I'm volunteering for chaperones. Grad students don't really need chaperones, yeah. so although we have had one or two. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. So life is good. Work-life balance, you know, a big part of our company doesn't have flexibility over their job schedule. It is a labor-based workforce with pilots and flight attendants, ramp agents. And so we do try and support that. Over the holidays, headquarters workers will be dispersed to just help and, and make people's our employees' lives a little bit easier in the stations. We're going to host Thanksgivings at almost every station. Um, because that's important to our people. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, I I mean, as far as the work life of people who work those kind of schedules, when you go into being a pilot or anything in kind of that realm, you know, the busiest holiday, busiest days for travel are around holidays. Yeah. And certainly are not going to get the uh, the flexibility that someone would in a corporate kind of environment where any of the work you're doing on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, you could be doing the week before. Yeah. So I think there's a little bit of that that's probably expected, mm-hmm. but great that you do what you can to make sure those those people have the time, at least as much time as they can with their family. And when they're at work, they're still celebrating. 
So, Lisa, when I worked here at UT Dallas, I, I was close to the MBA program. Actually, one of my first introductions was with a student group doing a competition. So it was one of your business case studies competition. And, and they came to me and said, is this real? Can we do this? And I was like, well, yes, of course you can. You're brilliant students and this, this is for fun. But if you did it this way, it could actually work out. And one of those students came back to me and said, hey, we won and you need to go to the MBA program. You're going to love it. And that was actually <laughs> my introduction to the MBA program uh, was through students. Um, it, it was pretty awesome. I've continued to I continued to mentor while I was here. And now that I'm away from UT Dallas, I continue. I had a student getting her MBA in South Dakota. She's a pilot for Southwest, was getting her MBA. And she's like, hey, I need a, a mentor on my master's thesis program. I'm like, of course, of course I will. Um, so really working here with you guys and going through the MBA program, seeing how involved all the students are, has made me want to continue that teaching and mentoring component in my career. I had a high school student in Hawaii. She was um, came to Southwest as a summer intern, reached out and said, hey, I'm interested in sustainability. We had a one-on-one -on -one over Teams. It was really great to see. And, and, and she asked the same question, what can I do to be more sustainable? I'm like, go check the recycle bins. Do they have them? Let's start easy. And then um, after her internship was over, she had a senior project and she's like, hey, I need a mentor for this. I'm like, you betcha. Really working with your MBA students, being one um, has really created a, a niche for me to continue that mentoring part. It's very fulfilling to me. So thank you for giving me that <laughs> access to students and, and continue that learning process. Yeah, that really is one of the things that are most common among our alums that I see is just such a high percentage of them give back and pay it forward, whether it's here at UT Dallas or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's really part of the culture here. And yeah. so it's really good to see, you know, folks who have been out for 10 or 15 or 20 years still of that mindset where when I was growing my career, I had this help and now it's my turn to yeah. help others. And that connecting is so valuable for work, for life, for your own self-worth. Absolutely. Thank you so much for visiting today. It's been too long. <laughs> it has. But now that we reconnected, uh, hopefully we'll keep it up. Yeah, and, excellent. And keep doing great work. Thank you. And to all of you students out there, this is a pretty great place to get an MBA. <laughs> I'm not biased. I'm a lot biased. But <laughs> Well, thank you for the, uh, the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Between Business and Life, brought to you by the UT Dallas MBA programs. To learn more about how an MBA from the Naveen Jindal School of Management can help you develop the skills and connections you need to live your best life, visit us online at mba.utdallas.edu. Thanks for listening to this episode of Between Business and Life. Join us online at betweenbusinessandlife.com to find episode notes, links, and more. Be sure to subscribe to Between Business and Life on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review. That will help spread the word about the podcast and UT Dallas MBA programs. To learn more about the UT Dallas MBA programs, visit us online at mba.utdallas.edu.